Good morning, everyone, and welcome. Thank you for joining us. We're here with Dr. Bull. She's a professor of pathology and laboratory medicine at the hospital, the University of Pennsylvania in Philadelphia. He earned his medical degree from Medical College in Pakistan. His PhD is from Hanuman University in Philadelphia. Dr. Belosha's research expertise is in molecular and immunopathology of thyroid neoplasia, and he has a clinical expertise in endocrine pathology, cytology, and histopathology. Thank you, Dr. Belosha, for joining us. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you for inviting me. Um, this is actually an honor. Um, to be here because uh, wherever I am is because of my mentors in pathology and uh, also especially patients. Um, I am by trade a cytopathologist who actually does biopsy on thyroid nodules. So I get to see the patients and help my clinical team. Uh, plus a pathologist on the other side, which looks at the thyroid surgical specimens. So without patients and without talking to them, without all the presentations there are, um, this is where we learn and really help others. So I'm really honored to be part of this uh, panel. This is this the first slide what I'm sh um, showing you is um, the title of my talk, but the, at the bottom, if you see, there are four great spots in Philadelphia that I really love. Um, these are my favorite spots. So if you happen to be in Philadelphia, please um, visit these spots. They're very calm, quieter, um, and you can just sit and um, watch uh, people go by. Um, so the next slide is very important also. And I put this slide because as you know, we all have gone through very tough times, um, you know, in the past almost two years now, um, where we have been secluded, quarantined, um, the social um, togetherness has been limited. So I personally think, and I think all of you probably have gone through it, where you have got to, you have really uh, understood the beauty around yourselves because sometimes we really don't take so much, um, you know, thought into it. We're always looking at to get away from home. But when you are really home, you really um, appreciate, at least I, I have begun to do that. So these are all the pictures that I have taken because I really walk to work and enjoy um, my surroundings. And I have become more and more and really um, uh, so thankful that I have all this in my life. And hopefully this will be over and we can be um, together soon. So I think I'm gonna start with this. And I know most of you know what a pathologist is um, since I've been invited to this meeting. So naturally some of you know that what pathologist um, is and they are very important part of your clinical team. Um, so if you look at pathology, um, it is vaguely defined as the study of disease, which comes from a Greek word pathos. Um, it is, but I personally think that the pathology is the basis of clinical medicine because we diagnose, we understand the disease and we ask questions. And some of you know that pathologists have really taken heads way in learning the disease process and really defining disease at the core or the cellular level. And then also understand why a tissue damage occurred and what are the causes of it. So based upon those, uh, multiple drugs and multiple therapy regimens have been uh, instituted. Also, when we look and the core of this understanding is when we look at the tissues under the microscope. So we look at the cell level and the study starts by looking at a very uh, few of the cells. And some of you may have gone through thyroid nodule biopsies. So, you know, we are putting a very thin needle, taking few cells and looking at it. And then those get related to even when the surgery is done. And then we define what the damage is and we uh, diagnose whether this is a benign process or a cancer. And then that helps the clinician to really devise the treatment. Since I am a pathologist, so I'm going to show you some pictures which are going to be have, uh, these are going to be gross pathology pictures which are going to show you the tissues. So I apologize for that in the start. Um, this is my trade and I know it's Saturday morning, it's breakfast time and you guys may be having breakfast and your coffee. And if you really get grossed out of it, I will give you a warning and close your eyes. 
but it's it's really not that bloody um, looking, but it just kind of gives you a, a, what I do and uh, what it takes to really diagnose uh, thyroid diseases, neoplasms and cancers. So I consider myself because uh, my expertise is in thyroid pathology. Um, and I actually got interested into it because one of my friends um, when I was in medical school, um, was diagnosed with thyroid cancer. And this was in Pakistan, um, where the, you know, the thyroid always is um, kind of on the bottom list um, because there's lung cancer, the breast and the other cancer. So thyroid is really not taken. And she had really tough time in handling thyroid diseases. And I was also interested in head and neck tumors. So this is where my love for thyroid diseases is started. I know it sounds morose, my love for thyroid disease, but I'm a pathologist, so I'm gonna use those words, so I apologize. Um, we are an integral part of the uh, clinical team, and we really sit um, and make those decisions along with the clinicians what to do. And I really uh, enjoy this uh, back and forth with the clinicians, and I really learned so much from clinicians as well as the patients. So I get involved when the thyroid nodule is found. This is the time a pathologist gets involved in your career team. Um, we are the ones who even biopsy, uh, some other pathologists even biopsy thyroid nodules. We look at those cells and define what needs to be done next. And before surgery, in some cases, as you know, there are now tests and you're gonna be hearing from Dr. Mickey Fro after me and he's gonna talk about those which are actually developed by pathologist teams. And those define which type of surgery can be done or if the surgery is going to be done or not. And then we get involved in looking at the thyroid resection specimens which come to us after surgery. So let's start with the basics. And I think this is very important. Even at my level, sometimes I have to go back to the basics and to the drawing board and really understand about thyroid because Thyroid is a very small organ. It is also called the butterfly gland because it looks like a butterfly, but it does so much for your body that it's basically, I think, all these small endocrine organs like pituitary, thyroid, parathyroid, basically kind of run the body by secreting hormones. So let's go to this. And sometimes I have to remind myself and go back to this and really understand. And that's how I understand the disease processes. So let's go to this and I'm going to use, see if I am successful, oh great, it works. So as you know, the thyroid sits in front of the trachea. It has two lobes, right and left lobe, and which are connected by the small piece of tissue, which is called isthmus. Now, if you really look at the thyroid cells, we're gonna be talking about mainly thyroid follicular cells, which make thyroid hormone and thyroid hormone is stored in this follicle. This is, this is a very functional or working unit of thyroid gland. There are other cells in the thyroid which are called parafollicular cells because para means on the side. So they sit on the side of the follicular cells and those are called C cells. They make calcitonins and that's where the medullary carcinoma or C cell hyperplasia happens. So most of your tumors that are in the thyroid come from thyroid follicular cells. And this is how they look on the microscope. So when, it, and that was actually a cartoon. So if you look on the microscope, this is the colloid and I'm just going to go it down and you can see this is just a hand drawing and how it matches on the microscope. These are the follicular cells which are lining the follicle. And this is where the thyroid hormone is stored. You, in the microscope, you cannot see the C cells because they are so few in number. So we have to do special stains to see the C cells. So we're gonna be mainly focusing on the tumors that are arising from the follicular cells. Now, if you look again at the thyroid epithelial cells, just a little bit of a review that we talked about, there are two cell types, follicular cells and C cells. C cells give rise to medullary carcinomas, and follicular cells give rise to benign tumors, which are called adenomas, and then they have malignant tumors, which are called carcinomas. Now, if you look at the follicular cells, the malignant tumors, broadly classified as four different types, you have papillary carcinoma, which is the most common thyroid cancer, follicular carcinoma, which we usually do not see in USA. It's not a common tumor, it is more common in uh, places which are iodine deficient. 
and then the high-grade tumors, poorly differentiated carcinomas and anaplastic carcinomas. I will not use the word good news, but most thyroid carcinomas are papillary carcinomas, which are very easily treatable. Cancer is cancer, but I think what's happening throughout the years by learning how the patients respond, we have begun to really understand that some of these tumors that we even call carcinomas are actually do not behave in a malignant fashion. So we're gonna get back to this very quickly. Now, this is very important. And I'm sorry if I'm gonna bore you with this lot of tech slides, but as a pathologist, the first thing that comes to mind, what is the process? So when we see on our pathology bench, thyroids, there are two types of thyroid enlargements. One is nodular, where you have multiple nodules in the thyroid gland, and the other one is the diffuse enlargement. Now let's look at it very quickly. So we're gonna talk about the diffuse enlargement. This is very rarely we see it, but do we still get these specimen? And most, when both lobes are enlarged of the thyroid and there are not many nodules in it, it's called the diffuse enlargement of the gland. And this is more common in benign diseases. The most common benign disease is Graves' disease and Hashimoto's thyroiditis, where you make less hormone. In Graves' disease, you make more hormone. So that is hyperfunctioning thyroid and hypo, that means less functioning thyroid gland. And that is the inflammation of the thyroid. Um, if you look at US versus Italy, in Italy, you will see mostly uh, multinodular goiter in uh, US, most commonly you will see Hashimoto's. So iodine sufficient versus iodine deficient diseases in different regions, which is kind of interesting. It does have a geographic pattern. Now, where the pathologist most commonly deal. So here's the gross uh, photo alert for you. So please close your eyes if you're not, cannot handle this. So the nodular thyroid enlargements can be a solitary nodule or a single or a dominant nodule. And these are the different terms we use for it. Solitary nodules, most tumors present as solitary or a single nodules. When there are multiple nodules, it's called multinodular goiter, but we do see cancers arising in the background of multiple nodules. So here it is, you can see this cartoon shows you multiple nodules, and this is actually the surgical specimen that we will get that will show multiple nodules. So now let's go back to thyroid nodules. And this is where I'm going to focus on. I'm a kind of a little nerd because whenever I go somewhere, all my friends are like describing paintings and they're looking at it, how beautiful they are. And I basically go in and say, oh, wow, look at this, this uh, figure has actually a thyroid nodule in it. So thyroid diseases have been plaguing us for centuries. And you can see here, this is one of the Renaissance painting and you can actually recognize that this person has goiter. And even in this uh, painting, you can see this giant goiter here. And this is just, I took a big shot of it and you can see here the goiter. So the thyroid diseases have been plaguing us for centuries. They are more common in genetic females. The good news is that the 90%, 5% of the thyroid nodules are benign. Only five to 10% are malignant. And this is what we are talking about. Now, thyroid nodules also occur in periodic age group. So it is not just a disease which is limited to adults. And here's one of, the, of these paintings, which is by Caravaggio. And you can see here a uh, little goiter in this a little kid here, which is like an angel. So, um, so this has been like through the centuries, both adult as well as uh, disease that affects the periodic population. So now let's talk about thyroid biopsy. And this is where I come in. And this is, this is something that I'm gonna spend a little bit more time on. Um, hopefully I will not bore you with this, but I think it's very important where does the pathologist comes in and how the thyroid nodule is evaluated and selected for biopsy and I get that specimen. As I said, there are some um, also pathologists who do fine needle aspiration biopsies. So this is the important um, history that is also important for me to diagnose thyroid diseases, tumors, as well as cancers. And as we know that the thyroid cancer is associated with head and neck radiation in childhood, um, because we see a lot of thyroid cancer in patients from Chernobyl, 
or um, you know where the the kids were exposed to um, external radiation. Also, family history of thyroid cancer. It used to be that the medullary carcinoma, which arises from C cells, was a familial disease. But now we also see that family history is also becoming important in the cases of papillary carcinomas. And also the history of benign thyroid disease is very important. Also, these patients do get screened more, so these nodules are found because some of these are very small tumors. So all this is very important for even pathologic diagnosis. And then the thyroid nod, thyroid is a uh, patient undergoes ultrasound evaluations. And this is a busy slide, but what I'm trying to show you here that the even ultrasound examination stratifies thyroid nodules on a spectrum for being low risk and high risk. And that's how the thyroid nodules are selected for biopsy. Once they are biopsy, this is where I come in. And the biopsy is really done under ultrasound guidance. The nodule is um, targeted. So this is actually a benign nodule. And this is actually a surgical slide specimen where a section is taken from this specimen. It's put under the microscope. And there's again that lot of colloid that I showed you where the thyroid hormone is stored. So this is a histology slide. So you can see there are only few cells taken from this put on a slide and me looking under the microscope, we can stratify and favor this to be a benign process or it's a neoplastic process or carcinoma. So this is the fine needle aspiration or biopsy preparation. And this is the surgical pathology specimen. So you can see this is all where the pathologist is involved in managing thyroid nodules. Now, once we get a biopsy, or a fine needle aspiration, which is done by a very thin needle. That's why it's called fine needle. And we look at the cells and the diagnose, and you, some of you must have seen these reports where we diagnose them according to the Bethesda classification scheme. And that actually has six different categories. And if you really look at this, you don't really have to go. So there's their category one to category six. So there are cases which are called benign, which do not have enough cells. And here is the benign, there is the malignant, and then there is this whole group of cases which are classified as indeterminate. So that is what the clinician will tell you is the middle group. And this is where further studies like molecular analysis will help us to further classify that what will be benign of these or what will be malignant by doing some molecular test. So this is very actually important for us to, so it is all on the spectrum. Remember the, um, just looking at those few cells, we can make a clear diagnosis of benign versus malignant, but in some cases we don't, and we will talk about it a little bit later. And each of this diagnosis is associated with a risk of malignancy that the clinician discusses with you. Now, this is my version of it, by looking at those few cells under the microscope. And this, um, I'm not gonna go through it because I'm not gonna make you a pathologist here, otherwise you will take me out of my job. But if you can see, th this is actually the benign group of cells here. This is more of this middle category. And you can see how big this middle category is because just looking at those few cells, we are not able to decide but then in some cases we can make diagnosis of suspicious for malignancy and malignancy. And th this is the group where the molecular studies are going to help us to define further. Now, what the biopsy, what you should expect from your biopsy. The biopsy in greater than 50% of cases, and actually the number is 60%, we can really diagnose and say this is a benign process or a benign nodule. In greater than 50% of the cases also, we can say that this is outright cancer and the most common cancer, which is papillary thyroid carcinoma can be diagnosed on cytology because the diagnosis of this common carcinoma is based upon looking at the cell and the cell features. Or we can say it is suspicious for a carcinoma. What 
cytology or FNA biopsy cannot do is differentiate between a benign neoplasm, which is adenoma, and certain carcinomas like follicular carcinomas. Because the difference between an adenoma and a carcinoma, follicular carcinoma, not papillary carcinomas, we're talking about follicular adenoma and carcinoma is invasion. And cytology, by just the looking at those few cells, we cannot differentiate between those two. And that's where the molecular studies help us. And really, cytology cannot diagnose some of the rare tumors of the thyroid. So this is the goal of the FNA, to really put down a framework for further managing these patients. And this is where the molecular testing, which Dr. Nikki Fro is gonna to talk to you about, helps us how to further define this, um, your treatment framework. So this is my version of it. This all matters in thyroid nodule management. This is where the pathologist comes in. Also the pathologists are involved here. And then when the surgery is done. So this is actually one of the uh, uh, paradigm that we follow how to manage thyroid nodules. Now, the surgeons must have talked to you about, and I'm sure you're gonna hear more about types of thyroid surgery. So the surgery can be where only one lobe is removed, portion of the thyroid is removed, or completion thyroidectomy. So these are the specimens we see in pathology. Now, again, gross specimen alert. Um, if you cannot handle it, please close your eyes. We, I will go through this very quickly. So this is actually the fixed thyroid specimen. And what I'm showing you on the left side, which is the right lobe from a patient that was diagnosed as carcinoma. And you can see some of these carcinomas are very small. This is the normal thyroid gland here. And this is the tumor is. As compared to this, which is a benign nodule, but you can see how big it is and it takes over the entire thyroid. This on FNA was called malignant and off on FNA, this one was called benign. So, but because it was so big, it was taken out. So just to show you that these tumors come in different sizes and shapes. And looking at this, this is the tumor and this is how we take the section. We put it under the microscope and you can see this, this is area is all benign thyroid. And here, just to point out to you, this is benign and this is the tumor is. And so you can see this is how it, this is the process which goes from gross examination, selecting the tissue, putting it on the slide and this is how the tumors will look. Now, let's talk about when we see a tumor then how we classify it. That means we have different bucket lists and we, put, we decide whether it's a papillary carcinoma, it's a follicular carcinoma, or it's one of these other rare tumors. So I, I, I know this is gonna be a little complicated to understand, but I think it's very important. I know you, are, you all are very, very intelligent people and um, you have really um, researched your diseases and also for your relatives or for yourselves. So, when a pathologist looks at the slide, there are always two major possibilities, but it is not black and white. Um, it's not always one or other. That means either it's a benign neoplasm, A, or it's B, which is malignant. What we have learned, then there is a middle category, which we call as low risk tumors. And we have begun to appreciate this more and more and when you heard from Dr. Tarl, he was talking about risk stratification in thyroid tumors. So this is also where the pathologist comes in. What we do realize that these low risk neoplasms or carcinomas are more close to benign tumors in their behavior. That means they act in a benign fashion. Similarly, if you look at the malignant tumors, so these are the benign tumors which are confined to the thyroids and most of them uh, have a beautiful, they're round in shape, they do not invade. And even within malignant categories that we call carcinomas, we have realized there are low risk malignant tumors, there are intermediate risk malignant tumors, and there are high risk malignant tumors. So this is very important to understand from a pathology point of view, because this is a learning process that we are all going through. And this is actually a secant tumor, and that white area is actually the capsule of the tumor. Now, this is our Bible. 
um, from a thyroid. And I, I apologize because I used the term Bible. So this is our gospel corpetology where we decide where, which helps us to classify those. So, this, so we are always updating this, how thyroid tumors should be classified. Now, the most common thyroid carcinoma, which is the papillary carcinoma, is a well-differentiated thyroid carcinomas. What does it mean by well-differentiated? That means it is still makes thyroid hormone less than the surrounding normal gland, but it still makes it. So C cells, medullary carcinoma will make calcitonin, or follicular carcinomas will make, or follicular the cell carcinomas that are coming from follicular cells, like papillary carcinoma, will make thyroglobulin. The papillary carcinoma is the most common. It is about 80% of all thyroid carcinomas that you see in countries like US where we have diet, which is iodine sufficient. It is more common in genetic uh, females. They come in all sizes. Up to 25% of thyroid carcinomas or papillary carcinomas are incidental or small tumors and nothing will happen. And even I may have one. So this is actually, and they can be like up, the highest number is 30%. So this is a common tumor. They are slow growing lesions. So when taken out on time, the patient is cured. They do metastasize some of them, but they metastasize to lymph nodes in the neck. So when a patient comes with thyroidinogel, the ultrasound also looks at the lymph nodes once the diagnosis of carcinoma is made. As I said, we can diagnose papillary thyroid carcinoma in almost 60% of the cases by looking at the cells because these cells have features, cytology or cytologic features that we can even look at by looking at the few cells. So that's why we can make this diagnosis because the diagnosis does not require for this tumor to be invasion, at least on the cytology. This is actually another gross picture alert. So this nodule is benign. And this tumor here, this little tumor is papillary carcinoma. And when we looked at it, you can see this is actually the benign thyroid here. And this is the tumor. And actually this is a lymph node, which actually had a tiny piece of tumor in it. So it had metastasized. So just to show you that Pathologists, by carefully examining the thyroid surgical specimen, even if it's taken for benign disease, and looking at those small things that maybe sometimes radiologists cannot see, we can really target those lesions and look at it under the microscope. Follicular carcinoma, which is rare, not so common in thyroid. It's about 5% of all thyroid carcinomas. It's more common in regions of the world which are iodine deficient, and that's where the multinodular goiter is also more common. The diagnosis of follicular carcinoma, so this is the tumor and this is the surrounding thyroid, is by when the tumor invades outside its confines. That means these are capsulated tumors. So if you look at this, this will be an adenoma and this will be a carcinoma when it invades like that. So, so if I'm, what I'm showing you here is tumor, which is invading. And that's why you can see cytology is only taking few cells. We will not be able to tell whether it's invaded or not. And that's where the molecular tests help us to say that this, the way the gen, uh, makeup, the molecular or the genes are working in these cells, this is, has a high risk of malignancy. Medullary carcinoma, is more common in families. It has a familial, strong familial component. Up to 30% of the cases, it arises from C cells and produces calcitonin. So these are the well-differentiated carcinomas. I think it's very important and which are the most common tumors that I see in my practice. Now, this is very important now, and this is um, where I'm gonna basically end my talk. What I'm talking about is when we put it all together, the pathologist is with you all the way. Um, even though you don't see us, um, you know, you see your clinicians and stuff. We get involved the time a patient with a thyroid disease walks into the office of the clinician. Because even if you have functional problems like hypothyroidism, hypofunctioning gland, or hyperfunctioning gland, 
the ultrasound examination is done. And if there's a nodule, it gets biopsied. And that's where the pathologists get involved in the treatment of the patient. And it comes to cytology, looking at the cells and deciding whether this is benign or it's malignant or in one of those intermediate categories. And we are also involved when there's molecular diagnosis. Then this now is deciding, and this is becoming a big factor to decide whether a lobe should be removed with the tumor or patient gets total thyroidectomy. And that's where the clinicians and surgeons decide. And then we again get involved by looking at the specimens and really deciding whether it's a low risk malignancy, intermediate risk malignancy, or it's a high grade malignancy like anaplastic or poorly differentiated carcinomas. And these things are really, really uh, evolving. The things before 2016 that we used to call carcinomas, now we have even taken, and thank uh, for Dr. Nikki Farrell, he put this whole panel together where we looked at the follow-up of these patients and decided that these tumors, which are confined to the thyroid gland, have not invaded, encapsulated. Now we call them as non-invasive follicular tumors and taking away the word carcinoma because the carcinoma word is a very, um, and I've seen this, that you know, I have good friends who have, uh, who have cancers and I know this has a lot of emotional burden. So by recognizing these low risk tumors, better treatments, we have come to really understand this whole, how we classify thyroid tumors and how we diagnose them. So this is, this is again, very important as a pathologist to me. And since I'm a pathologist, my friends always send me these, um, you know, I, I get these jokes and I sometimes just get a little frustrated because they, it's, but I, it's funny, you know, it makes you chuckle. And this is just was sent to me a couple of days ago by, by a friend. Um, because whenever you think of pathologists, you always think that they, we just do autopsies and you know, we, we really don't get involved into the, with the live patients, which is, which is actually not true. So this, I, I got a little chuckle through this and I thought I will share it with you also. And this is actually one of my um, very um, good read, which is written by a very junior pathologist. And what I liked about this writing that he did um, for, a, for a blog for patients, really he laid it out what is becoming more and more important. So the pathologist just doesn't sit behind the microscope and closes their doors. Um, we are actually involved in talking to the patients. Naturally, it has to be under the understanding of your clinician who really sees you uh, every day. And as you know, there's now CARES Act. And because of this, the patients are actually getting pathology reports even sometimes before the clinician sees it. Um, so I am getting more and more calls from the, uh, from the patients. And this last line is very powerful that when facing a challenge such as cancer diagnosis, knowledge can indeed be powerful. And that part, piece, part of this knowledge is also the pathologist. So pathologist is very important in your care. And this is my last slide. I'm just gonna give you a little glimpse about, um, I'm a very private person, but I also want to give you a glimpse in my life. Um, you know, my life uh, for the last two years and all of us, our lives have changed and it has become very, very important to take again account um, of regardless of race, religion, any orientation, we all as humans have suffered through this, um, through this pandemic. And, and I think what is becoming very important, all the small things that are in our lives. So these are the things I enjoy. And I just wanted to give you a glimpse. Uh, we finally met at the bottom left, uh, friends, and we are all vaccinated, boosted up. And these are all clinicians that we, we got, got together for a, for a little gathering. So things are coming back and hopefully we'll all um, be good. So thank you so much for inviting me. And now I am open to any questions you have. Thank you. Thank you, um, Dr. Below. That was fantastic. I love seeing the uh, pictures, even though they're, you know, early morning. Um, <laughs> if you have questions, please feel free to submit them through the Q&A. Um, we got a few questions that we can start with. Um, mm -hmm. And so Barb and I will be bouncing back and forth. So the first question was, what is calcification of nodules and what does it mean with regard to the disease? So the, um, so calcification, so, you know, the, the, the word calcification has, has got a 
big bad rap. Um, so, so let's understand this. The, the way the body responds is um, if something gets, um, something dies, um, like it degenerates, we use the word degeneration and necrosis. Those are the words you're going to see in your pathology report. So when something in body degenerates, the body responds by putting in what is called a fibrosis or a scar tissue. And sometimes that scar tissue has um, deposits of calcium. And that's what is called calcifications. Calcifications can be larger calcifications, which are called macro calcifications. So macro means large, micro means small. So the macro calcifications are common also in benign nodules. Now, if you think about a tumor, is sitting nicely in, a, in its kind of, let's think about an egg, right? So egg shell and the egg yolk is in the middle. So that egg shell is the capsule that is guarding the tumor, right? And the, if the tumor invades, the body response, host response is to contain it. And when they try to contain it, they try to kill it and that it becomes more fibrotic and there's calcification. So those egg shell calcifications in the surrounding of the tumors are more suspicious. So whenever you see those, even though that can happen in a benign neoplasm on ultrasound, those are picked up. So we're talking about macro calcifications. Now, small calcifications, which are called micro calcifications, or you will see the radiology report use the term echogenic foci. That means they're brighter. So the micro calcifications are common in papillary thyroid carcinomas, but you can see sometimes, so there's a lot of variability in radiologists reading microcalcification. So whenever the term microcalcification is used, that is the nodule they will biopsy. So those are basically some things which will say, okay, biopsy, not to biopsy. So those are the features that the radiologists, I'm, I, I'm trying to simplify it, but I hope I, I answered those, that question. Thank you. We have another question in the chat. Um, how is the tall cell variant of papillary carcinoma diagnosed? Okay, so there are different subtypes of papillary carcinomas. Um, so the most common one is classic variant, which is actually the one which is very treatable disease. Um, the other one is follicular variant, which is also a cancer, but it forms follicles. So um, the tall cell variant is a type of carcinomas which has been associated with so that's much more aggressive form of papillary carcinoma. It is more associated with lymphatic invasion, lymph node metastasis, and in some cases, tall cell variant can transform to anaplastic, which is a high-grade carcinoma. However, there are cases of tall cell variant, which are smaller tumors, which are confined to the thyroid gland, even if they have lymph node metastasis, the patient do very well, and after total thyroidectomy or some form of radioactive iodine. And in some cases, the clinicians will not even give radioactive iodine and those patients do well. So tall cell variant has a morphologic features and one of those common feature is that's what it gets the name of tall cell. It has taller cells. So the cells are three times taller than the width. And when we see this and then and its other features and we'll say, okay, this looks like a tall cell variant. I personally, when I look at a tall cell variant, I get very careful in submitting more sections, making sure that I have excluded all the other pathologic features which are associated with aggressive disease. And tall cell variant is more common in older population, so. Thank you. So how can, how can a fine needle a biopsy of, thyroid, of a thyroid nodule be deemed as negative but the patient has follicular thyroid cancer. Is it because those cancer cells need to be observed outside the nodule for it to be classified as a cancer? So just a biopsy may not detect this cancer? So the follicular carcinoma, so, you know, the, um, so papillary carcinoma, we, we talked about the nuclei, right? You look at the nuclei. Now follicular thyroid carcinoma makes, forms follicles. It basically recapitulates the surrounding thyroid tissue. Right, the only the cells are a little bit larger, but they look similar, and on under the microscope, like so, those specimens ha either have a lot of cells, and I will say there's a lot of cells in it, and that looks like could be a tumor or or is a tumor, but cannot say benign versus malignant. Mm -hmm. In some cases, the follicular 
carcinomas have follicles which are filled with a lot of colloid. And a lot of colloid is always a feature of benign nodules. So in those, those are the cases sometimes which are underdiagnosed as benign. But remember, one has to really focus on, I'm not saying that you should not question a diagnosis, but the, what goes, it, it's, it's, I, I, I take it as a puzzle. You know, so when you have a puzzle, there are different pieces that are working together. Ultrasound was suspicious that why that nodule was biopsy. Even if I called it benign, the ultrasonographer or the clinician say, well, you know, this nodule was suspicious. Thyroid tumors grow very slowly so they can come back to it, re-biopsy it. So, and we're getting really better at it. So whenever, if I said calling something benign that was suspicious on ultrasound, I will double check myself and relook at everything again to make sure it is. So it is, again, it's, a, it's, it's looking at few cells and sometimes there's a lot of back and forth because you're talking about tumors that recapitulate the normal thyroid architecture. So that, those will be the cases that will be underdiagnosed. Okay, we have another question, kind of similar. Can a hurdle cell um, thyroid cancer be identified via uh, fine needle fine needle aspiration? So hurdle cell, we can we yes. Yeah, so the hurdle cell carcinoma has the same features that you see in follicular carcinoma. It's just the cells are pink, pinker cells. I call it the pink cells you can see everywhere. So there's a pink cell tumor, but those tumors also have a benign counterpart, which is an adenoma. And if it invades, it's a carcinoma. By looking just at the cells, we cannot tell it's carcinoma or it's an adenoma, which is benign. We can only say it's heart cell cells, a lot of heart cell cells. So it's either atypical or it's a neoplasm. And then the molecular test will help us, you know, that this is, this is going, this requires surgery or this is benign. Thank you. But I just want to point out here, Barbara, I just want to mention that, that when sometimes, you know, um, Google is good, but when the patient gets the diagnosis and I get a lot of calls, they, they say, you know, I put the hurtful cells in, in the Google and it gave me all this bad thing that, you know, hurtful cells are really bad and stuff. Actually, it's not true. Hurtful cells, we do, all of us have hurtful cells as we grow older. This is the senescence of the cells. So having a hurtful cells in your report, you know, the risk is based upon the size of the nodule, how bad it looks on the ultrasound, not because you saw a few heart cells. Off. So I just wanted you guys to really think about, you know, those keywords doesn't mean that it's, it's a bad diagnosis. It still can be a benign tumor. All right. Um, so this question says, how do you feel about KI-67? So KI-67 is a proliferation marker. What it does, it really looks at the cells and it, uh, looks at the proliferating cells, right? Most thyroid tumors, which are well-differentiated tumors, like papillary carcinoma classic or follicular variant, the KI-67 is usually low than 1%. Now, some aggressive thyroid tumors, because they're proliferating on a higher rate, the KI-67 will be higher. Again, looking at the KI-67 does not prove that it is malignant. KI-67 can also be higher in the cells, which are just repairing themselves, like needle biopsy is a damage to the thyroid tissue. So KI-67 can be higher in the cells around that needle tract within the nodule. So KI-67 is again, that one piece of the puzzle by looking at it. So if my KI-67 in a case was higher, I will be more careful. I will submit more sections to make sure I am not missing an aggressive tumors. Now, something I thought that has a morphology of an aggressive tumor, I will throw in a KI-67 to make sure that that picture is complete by giving a KI-67 percentage. It's still in the studies, if you look at the big validation studies, the KI-67, yes, has proven to be associated higher level with some aggressive tumors, but I don't think it's really completely validated. So looking at the KI-67 level, Again, by the, in a vacuum without everything else, you know, to me, it's, it's really not, doesn't help. Okay, we have another question um, from someone who wants to know if um, thyroid disease is more aggressive in a young male patient. Since you had said mostly it affects older women here, how does it affect younger men? <laughs> now, so, you know, um, 
So we always, when I was getting, um, you know, when I was doing, when I, when I was a baby in pathology, there was always thing that a thyroid nodules are more common in women and most of them are benign. But a thyroid nodule, larger thyroid nodule in a man over 40, over 60, that was bad. You know, it's actually, if you look at the population studies, you know, thyroid diseases are not, you know, nodules are not that common when you compare them with, with female population and males. I, I personally think it does not hold true that in a younger male, you have a thyroid nodule, it has higher chances of being cancer. To me, every, it's the ultrasound, the clinical presentation. I mean, I'll tell you, I, I biopsy a lot. I've seen in a pediatric age group. I mean, you know, it's it tends to be you see basically equally benign as well as malignant cases. So I don't think it's it's a bigger difference. Yes, if a tumor is six centimeter and happens to be in an older male and aggressive with lymph node metastasis, that's a cancer in a male patient. So it just the thyroid cancers are uncommon, uh, nodules are uncommon, and what you see in male patients tend to be cancer. Yes, there's a little validation there, um, but I don't think it's something to really, um, really be too concerned about, to be honest, what I have seen. Okay, thank you. So with a papillary diagnosis of a lymph node biopsy, is there any advantage in having a, a subsequent, subsequent biopsy one to three years later, if cancer is being monitored with no surgery yet? So, you know, that that's a very tough question. Um, personally, um, I can only, t I, I, as a pathologist, I cannot comment how the, how the persons are treated or followed. So that is my disclaimer at this point. Um, at our institution, if a nodule is biopsied, um, a lymph node is biopsied, it shows papillary carcinoma, um, depending upon the patients, you know, how, how the patients present and stuff. In most cases, in the majority of the cases, they will go back biopsy thyroid. So one of the things one has to understand, the, the diagnosis of papillary carcinoma, there are other rare tumors from other parts of the body that can mimic papillary thyroid carcinoma. So they have to really prove that this is coming from thyroid. The other way, sometimes what they do, they take those cells and they send it for a what is called a thyroglobulin levels. So they look at that specimen and if it's making thyroglobulin, they know that's from thyroid. Um, they will check and see how big is the thyroid cancer is to be really treated. In most cases, what I have seen at my institution, they will treat that cancer because now it's in a lymph node. If you already had thyroid cancer, it has been removed. And now what you are seeing is you have other conditions like cardiac conditions and lung and all that other problems. And if you have a very tiny metastasis in a lymph node, they're gonna grow very slowly. So the clinician will say, we'll just watch it. Why to biopsy and put somebody else under surgery for such a slow growing process, which the patient can live their normal lifespan. So I, I come from both, both sides on it. Um, you know, once it's proven, then you know, then your team decides. But I cannot tell you for a specific case how that should be handled. Okay, we have another question, maybe more of a clarification. Um, the pathology says it's a high grade um, tumor, but another one called it just a poorly differentiated papillary tumor. Is there a difference in these two? So so this is actually a very important and a very intelligent question, not to say that other questions were not intelligent. So this is something that we have, we are talking about it now. So there is a, there's, there, there are types of follicular and papillary carcinomas, which are aggressive tumors. And they act exactly the same as poorly differentiated carcinomas. So if you, if you look at the good acting tumors, papillary carcinomas and the bad acting tumor is anaplastic poorly differentiated sits in the middle in the prognosis. So these higher or aggressive tumors act like poorly differentiated carcinomas. And in the new classification schemes, we will be putting them together. I really don't think there is a there is something bad about someone calling it aggressive or high grade papillary carcinoma, other one calling it poorly differentiated because they're gonna behave in a similar fashion. The clinicians may say that the poorly differentiated carcinoma sometimes may be a little hard to treat with radioactive iodine, but 
most cases they they can so um so it's it's basically they sit in this middle prognosis so i don't think there is clinically it's going to be such a big difference to be honest if you create right. bucket lists yeah. so we have a few questions asking for clarification so um, could you tell us the differences um, between tall cell, clear cell, warfarin, hobnail? Um, and I know, right? Uh, but you know, we talked. You talked about these in your presentation, and, and a couple of folks had different questions around what's the difference between these and um, the aggressiveness of of the versions. Okay, uh, very good question. You guys know too much. <laughs> I should have come. More, I should have made my my presentation more complicated. Uh, now I feel bad. Now, so. Um, so as I said, the most common variant is classic variant. So by looking at the cell type, there are different variants of papillary thyroid carcinoma, the most common being classic variant and follicular variant. Tall cell, hob male, and preliminar cell variants are aggressive tumors. That means they can have more lymph node metastases. They can have vascular invasion, blood vessel invasion, or they can be associated with extra thyroidal invasion. That means they go outside the thyroid. But there are also cases of hobnail and tall cell and columnar that I've seen that are encapsulated, just a little piece of tall cell with mixed in with the classic variant. When I see those tumors, I am a little careful because what happens is, and I will mention it in my report, that there is some tall cell or some columnar or some hobnail. So these are morphologically tumors that are associated with some aggressive pathologic features. But when we do mention a tall cell, the clinician may watch it more clear, carefully because even after the thyroidectomy is done, if there's a recurrent tumor, the tall cell may be the tumor which may recur, not the classic. So these are aggressive tumors, but when you really put all the pathologic variables together, you know that by the clinical risk stratification, they do sit in the kind of in the middle, they kind of move up. So these will be, some of these tumors, some of those cases of tall cell or hobnail will be classified as high-grade papillary thyroid carcinomas. So they are aggressive variants, and we can differentiate them by looking at the, the features. So, um, so and they, they can be actually, some of them can be picked up on cytology also. So I will say sometimes on cytology, it looks like a tall cell variant or suggest that it may be. Um, and they, on the molecular profile, when you do the molecular analysis, they do kind of sit differently than the classic variant. But again, remember the risk of stratification is based upon even the low risk tumors. You can have up to five lymph nodes with micrometastasis. So it's not a death sentence to have a tall cell or a hobnail. It's just the watchful eye will be different. And some of the aggressive tumors may arise from these variants. So I hopefully I answer the question. All right, so we have another question. If you could go back to one of your slides again and show how you identified the, a benign and a malignant tumor and also if an RAI um, cell would look like too. Um, Is that possible? I'm not sure. No, I mean, um, so I don't know the, the, so the, you know, the diagnosis of papillary carcinoma is by looking at the cells. But we are coming to the point where the diagnosis of, of the main difference between a carcinoma and a benign tumor, which is the adenomas, is invasion. Even that's why the non-invasive follicular variant of papillary carcinoma is now not called carcinoma. It's NIFTP or non-invasive follicular tumor with papillary-like nuclei. So we are all coming to like a head to the point where we're saying, even if we call it papillary carcinoma, it has to have invasive feature. It has to be classic papillary. So we are kind of moving away even from the nuclei. What cytology does, as I said, looking at those nuclei will say, this looks like a papillary carcinoma or this looks like a tumor. And then the molecular studies help. So um, I cannot comment on our, 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 uh, you know, radioactive iodine therapy, because to me, that is something a clinician decides. Um, most differentiated tumors take up radioactive iodine because they're still making thyroid tumor, uh, thyroid hormone, um, less than the surrounding thyroid. So I cannot really comment on that because I, I don't do that. That's not my, uh, my expertise. I look at the slides, so. Yeah, here's another good question. 
when would you send a tumor sample for genomic testing? So I will send, you mean the cytology or the surgical pathology? So I, I will answer both. So cytology yeah. samples I will send when I can call it atypical. That means I, there are some cells that I'm worried about, but I'm not sure they are malignant. Or I say, this is a tumor, cannot differentiate between a benign tumor and a malignant tumor. Or I will say there are some cells that are suspicious for a malignant tumors, but not enough. That means it's a quantitative or qualitative. That means I have a lot of cells, but they not, they're showing some, but not all the features. Or there are a few cells, but they really look suspicious. So those are the three categories. So Bethesda category three, four, and five, which is atypical, neoplasm, and suspicious that I will send for genomic testing on cytology to clarify my diagnosis. And I will tell you, when we call something atypical, the benign call rate after molecular analysis can be up to 80%. So 80% of those patients, the molecular diagnosis will come back as negative or very low risk of carcinomas or, or benign. And those patients can be just followed clinically because your clinicians will still follow you. You know, you have a thyroid nodule. The search path. Now I have a thyroid out, did the sections, look at the cases. We'll send it for molecular testing only in cases in which those aggressive tumors, because now you have markers that those tumors can be tested for or can be treated. So there are a lot of these kinase therapies and instead of chemotherapies. So we will test the tumor sample um, to have a more comprehensive genetic makeup on that. And then those aggressive tumors can be treated with other markers. So that, that is that for chemotherapy or some other targeted agents. We have one more. When um, you get the PATH report and saying you have different types of cancer, say the pathology says 30% tall cell, 70% papillary, how do they determine that? So it's basically, um, it's, like, it's like an eyeballing. So in most can cases, we do submit the entire tumor, you know, mass, I mean, in, in majority of the cases. And then when I'm looking at the slide, I will decide by looking at all the sections that the 70% is classic papillary and 30% is tall cell. By the way, now the criteria is if you have a 30% or more tall cell, you call the entire tumor tall cell because it's gonna behave like a tall cell. So by looking at that, I will make the diagnosis and that's how a lot of pathologists do. We'll say the majority of the tumor is classic variant, but there is a small focus of tall cell and will give a approximate percentage. Um, because to me, it's I have seen cases in which there's a little bit of a tall cell, mostly classic papillary, and what metastasizes is the tall cell. So by saying this, the clinician will follow this much more aggressively and make sure that there is not any recurrences and stuff. And I will also mention that the tumor which is going outside the thyroid is a tall cell or a classic. So the reports can be really, do but again, remember when we put the report, that report helps the clinician to stage the patient. And depending upon the stage of the patient, that's how the treatment is devised. And that also clarifies age at the diagnosis, tumor invades or outside the thyroid or not, how big is the tumor? Those all things are taken into account to stage the patient properly so you can be managed. That's why some patients are not even given radioactive iodine. Tumor was in the thyroid, taken out the lobe even, rest of the thyroid gland is fine. You will not even get radioactive iodine um, in some cases. So it's all, it's all that piece of that, the puzzle. All right, well, <clears throat> excuse me, we have reached um, 9.30 already. We had 35 questions, we didn't make it to all, um, but if, you, if it's in the Q&A, it, uh, it is being recorded. So thank you all for submitting questions. Thank and thank you, Dr. Azubair. We really appreciate it. I love the slides. I, I love seeing stuff like that. Um, and um, it's really great to see and hear from a pathologist too about the, the work that you're doing behind the scenes to help uh, thyroid cancer patients. So thank you. Uh, thank you for inviting me and thank you for being a great audience and Q&A. And you guys, the hosts were great. You were wonderful. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. And enjoy the rest of the thyroid uh, 2021 conference. Thank you.